So far we've covered the basics of creating forms in HTML. Now I want to show you a few other features that you have when designing your own forms. So let's create another h1 tag here and call this intermediate forms. For intermediate forms, I want to show you some additional features that you have available when designing your forms and also how to design your forms in a way that's more accessible. And by accessible, in case you're not familiar with accessibility standards for the web, it really means designing it in a way that people with disabilities, specifically vision impaired or blind individuals, can have screen readers read out the text on a web page more easily and understandably. So that's what I mean when I use the word accessible in the context of a web page. So let's create another form here. And then this time we're going to create a text area. And note that with the text area, if you're using Chrome or Firefox, you should be able to expand it to be as, as large or as small as you'd like. And here in the text area, we can basically submit an essay. Another form element that we have available is a selector. Select, and in order to populate this selector with choices, we have to provide a tag called option. And inside the option, we can add, for example, cheese, like cheddar cheese. Uh, another option for goat cheese. Another option for mozzarella. And now, when we select our drop down menu, it'll give us the option to select goat cheese, mozzarella, or cheddar cheese. So that's another element that we have available. Finally, the last element I want to cover, and for this I want to create a separate form. And this last element I want to cover is the multiple choice or radio button. And remember, input is a self-closing tag. Type equals radio. So as soon as we gave it the type radio, it became shortened and became much smaller into just one input. So in order to give this radio input a label or a value, we have to specify the value of, again, we're gonna go with the cheese example. You might have cheddar. Oh, but wait, the value attribute didn't show up. What's going on here? See, when we type value, the word search shows up as the default value. It even worked for the button. So it turns out the proper way to specify labels for radio buttons is actually with a special tag called a label. And this brings us to some really interesting use cases for label. So instead of value of cheddar, we specify the label cheddar. And then we can create another input here. Type equals radio. And let's enter a breakpoint here. And then create another label of mozzarella. But now this brings up an interesting point when it comes to accessibility. We have these elements arranged in order. Somebody looking at this form might be able to understand what this form is for, but a screen reader would just say radio button, cheddar, radio button, mozzarella. And that may not be the best way to structure your form because there's no way for this label to know inside our HTML that this label is for this radio button. We have to link them together somehow. And this would especially be the case if, for example, let's say for styling purposes, you wanted to separate out the input from the label inside a table, ha. Huh. Or if these two elements were separated, then a screen reader wouldn't really have a way to link back the input and the label. So a label has a special attribute called for. For now, we're, we're just gonna keep this empty because what this accepts as the text inside of the for attribute is a unique identifier for the input, which it is a label for. And 
This label tag right here is essential for making your form elements more accessible. In fact, screen readers are really good at detecting labels and what they are labels for. And by screen readers, I mean either built-in browser features that read text out loud or devices specifically created for the vision impaired or vision disabled in order to read web pages. I'm going to give this input a unique identifier. Again, this is a global property that you can assign to any HTML element. And we'll be using this ID selector much more when you get into CSS. For now, let's give this first input a unique ID of cheddar. Now that we've given this unique ID, let's just say label for cheddar. Note that this has nothing to do with the text inside the label. This is a unique identifier that we've called cheddar, and then a label which is referring to the input's unique identifier that really accomplishes two things. The screen reader knows that this is a label for the input cheddar, and the form also has some idea of what this label is for. So we're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna give the second input, which is a radio button, a unique ID. I'm just gonna shorten mozzarella to moz. In the for property, I'm going to give it a label for moz. Just to emphasize, that the text inside has nothing to do with the unique identifier. Now let's create a, a line break and create a third input and give it a unique ID of goat cheese or just goat and then type equals radio. And underneath it, let's create a label and inside the label, go to cheese. And then let's give this label a four property of goat. Again, this linking with for to a particular ID links these two elements together. HTML is not aware that this label is for this input otherwise. You may want to have an input be in a separate element from the label. And in that case, the label still needs some way to link itself to this input because these are two separate tags. Input is a self-closing tag, so it can't have any other tags inside of it. And with a label, you need some way to link the label back to an input. There is one other way to create a label which is not recommended. And again, it's not recommended for accessibility reasons because not all screen readers are good at detecting this. So another way to create a label is to actually go ahead and define the label, and then inside the label, create an input equals radio. Let's add, a, let's add a line break here. And then after the radio button, we add our actual label. Let's call it blue cheese. This is another way to structure a label, but again, it's not recommended because screen readers will not always be able to detect the label blue cheese is for this input. The for property is designed for linking to another input. This structure, although it'll work and although it looks the same, is not as standard. Okay, let's create a submit button for this form and, and add a little bit of a description. So above here, let's add some description. Select your favorite cheese. And now let's create a submit button. Input type equals submit value equals submit. And let's add a line break. Since we're on the topic of accessibility, I wanna point out that a screen reader may be able to read the value of the form submit, but it doesn't really have a detailed enough description associated with it. So for screen readers, we can add another property called, let's just scroll down here, aria described by. And this, similar to the for attribute, will accept the identifier of a descriptive element. Convention would have it that in general, you don't want the descriptive element to be a part of your form. So 
This is a new tag here that we haven't covered before, but it's a standard block element that can accept paragraph and a heading too. So it's a standard block element that can accept multiple elements nested inside it. Description for submit button, pressing the submit button will confirm your selection for your favorite cheese. And as I mentioned before, similar to the for attribute, the aria described by attribute also takes the ID, the unique ID of an element. So let's give this div an ID of cheese-submit and then give this aria described by attribute cheese-submit. This will tell screen readers that, hey, in case the user wants more information about what this button does, point them to this div. And in case you don't want everyone else to see this div, you can give it a little bit of a style. And this style property is visibility hidden. That will hide the description for seeing users, but still keep it available and accessible for screen readers. So those are a few more advanced features. And before I forget, since we're on the topic of accessibility and forms, there is one other thing I wanna cover, and that's around images and making images accessible. So let's go back to Google image search here, find a, find a real nice image. Let's go back to cats this time. This is a good one. Let's try this as our image source. It is a JPEG image, so it should be showing up down here. Let's give it a property of height equals 200 so that it's nice and viewable. Now, to describe images to screen readers, images also have a special property. Alt, the alt text of an image accomplishes two things. One is accessibility, right? It allows screen readers to describe the image to vision impaired or vision disabled users. And second of all, it also makes your images indexable by search engines. So alt, and this is some text to describe the image, and we can describe this as cat holding up left paw to camera. And this alt text will be how the image will be read by screen readers. Really important property, image alt text. That's all for accessibility. There are more detailed accessibility standards that I recommend you look into. And we are going to continue to sprinkle little bits of accessibility here and there throughout the course, because it is important to design your web pages for all users and not just the 90% of users.